Hi, I'm Lou Eisen, boxing writer, historian, and soon to be author this week. And we have a very, very special guest on today's show. Somebody I've been waiting a long time, somebody I admire greatly to have on, Mr. Jason Winders. And Jason wrote the magnificent book on, which you sent me an autograph copy, uh, George Dixon. George Dixon is the first, was the first black person ever, ever to hold a world boxing title. He's the first one to to lose it, the first one to regain it. He was a multi-divisional champion, invented the speed bag and and shadow boxing and one of the all-time greats. And there isn't even a stamp from Canada Post honoring him. But he's a was one of the pillars of modern boxing and we're pleased as punched, no pun intended, to have the author of this magnificent tome, Mr. Jason Winders, on our show today. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, Lou. This is a this is a real honor, man. Oh, thank you. The honor is all ours, and especially mine. They, I, I have a question I want to ask you right off the top about George Dixon. Um, a while, about the, in the last year, I know you've seen this clip. There's a clip of of Barbados Joe Walcott in the '30s talking from Madison Square Garden, where he was working as a janitor, and he talked about Gans and Joe Kowinski and different people. Are there any, I guess there wouldn't be, but would there be anything of Dixon's voice? Or maybe not because he died in 1908, so it wasn't soon enough yet? Yeah, the, the, the part, of his, part of his erasure from, from modern memory is that there's just very little in the digital space of him. So you have no, mm -hmm. you have no voice recordings that I know of. There's one very short clip, which is a staged uh, fight that was filmed in front of a kind of a fake really audience nice. that you can find on YouTube. Very, very staged thing. So uh, him, yeah. and his, him and his later years. Um, and even even for historians, the, some of the hardest part, there's very little that we know of that's actually in his voice, like written. Um, so his, uh, you know, no, no personal letters. There's a few things that are in newspapers that are um, that I bring up in the book that are supposedly in his voice, but sure sound a lot like his manager, Tom O'Rourke. <laughs> you know, so I probably ghost written. So yeah, he's he's a real enigma and probably part of part of his erasure for a hundred years has been just not having that wild paper trail line or digital trail line. Right. I mean he he just it's interesting because O'Rourke was not a nice person and read in your book how, you know, he would slap Dixon at times, but he treated a lot of fighters uh, poorly. And when you look at Dixon, there's a, I, I'm wondering if you've seen that picture in the Three Colored Aces by Nat Fleischer. Mm -hmm. um, it's a photo stat in the book, but I, I, I've never been able to find the original of Dixon at the back of the book uh, with a dog, a huge dog and a bunch of friends mm -hmm. around him. And I thought, what a great picture! But it's a photo stat that came out with the original book. And, uh, you have, and one of the ahead. few non non studio photography of him. You know, a lot of the stuff that I tracked down for the, you know, you can you can find a few things that are in there, and mostly it's from those. Um, uh, the Black Dynamite series has some sketches, um, and then but but the Black Aces has uh, that photo. But there wasn't a lot of images of him. I worked a little bit. They had just recently digitized, when I started on the book, they'd recently digitized at the Harvard Library a bunch of old cabinet cards that uh, had pictured stars of that of that time. So a lot of the a lot of the pictures in the book uh, come from that. But yeah, there's, I mean, that's one of the very few, what would you call it? Casual, intimate moment kind of photo <laughs> of him. Right. Not posed or, or, or not in his ring attire. So uh, there's another one in real later life that I've also never been able to find the original on. He's, I mean, he wasn't that old, but he looks like he's 100 years old at the time, but he's only in his 30s, but um, wearing kind of a straw hat. That I have no idea where that matter. Right, I've seen that, yeah. And there's that famous one with him and, and uh, Barbados Joe Walcott and Joe Gans. Mm -hmm. And they none of them look happy, but of course they're not getting paid no. for promise. They're getting ripped off by racist no. managers, and it, you know it, it. The picture can't talk, but it does talk. It does tell you, like you know, 
their look in their face tells you this is what's going on with us right now. And that's such an interesting time, right? And and it's you know, Dixon can only exist in our history for about a 30 year period. Like it's that period right after the end of the Civil War and right before the separate but equal that comes out of Plessy versus Ferguson that really starts to set it set in the, the into motion um, the racial divide in the states. Um, there's that 30 year period there where there is some quote unquote opportunity for black advancement. There's some opportunity for black success and to accumulate wealth. Um, it, anytime earlier, it, there, blacks are enslaved in the states, and anytime later they're being legislated out of power. So there's this really interesting window that Dixon could only exist within this 30 year window in its history. I think even afterwards, even after you get to, you know, later time periods where, where even some of the black athletes are starting to gain some traction, you know, Dixon was so tiny, like you're talking the age of the heavyweights by that time. So yeah, like really this window, the, the the light the lighter smaller fighters were still packing them in and 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 were gaining interest and hundreds and hundreds of newspaper articles are still being written about him so I, I I love that fact about Dixon and that he can just there's a moment in time in America that he could exist and that's and he existed in that moment <laughs> so, yeah. oh yeah I mean people people have to understand that with with, with George Dixon the time frame it's right after the civil war he was born five years after the civil war ended you know uh, august 29th and then you go to um you know 20 years later 1890 it's only 25 years after the end of the civil war so you know america is still very much in that time frame there's still stuff happening but you're right he's constricted by the by by the racism and endemic to uh, uh endemic to his er era and i was going to tell you a, a quick story uh i went online to the canadian sports hall of fame it used to be in toronto it's in calgary now mm -hmm. and they had a picture of george of, of jack johnson getting off the boat uh in victoria and he couldn't find a place to stay but there he is on the boat and he's towering over everyone and it says canadian champion world champion george dixon and so I called them and they said, well, our historian said, I said, your historian's full of you know, what? I said, Dixon was tiny, you know? <laughs> You're looking at a guy who's not much bigger than Danny DeVito. I mean, yeah. he's 5'2", five, 5'3", five, at the most. You know, uh, um, uh, uh, Johnson was six, one and a half. And what's the date of your picture? Uh, 1911. Right, Dixon died three years earlier. That'd be quite a piece. <laughs> To actually come back from the dead and then grow over a foot. I'm gonna to have to add a chapter or two. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely. So it's it, it saddens me that people, like I mentioned before, Canada Post. I sent a whole dossier on him. I re referenced your book. I said, get this book, buy this book. This guy's a hero, and he's starting to be claimed by American historians. And when mm -hmm. I spoke to Adam Pollock, a publisher down there, and and brilliant writer, he said. He said, listen, Canadians, as a rule, don't like to hang on to their heroes. They don't care about them, especially the sports heroes. So that's your problem. And they didn't even read it. I, they, they said, who would be interested in him as opposed to they mentioned someone else? And I said, the woman you gave a stamp to deserves a stamp. I'm not stupid. I'm not going to denigrate her. But she wasn't born in Canada. George Dixon was born here and he was raised here and he was the first he had so many firsts in his career he was a man of firsts and why he and right? you know one of the interesting things is is that those blurred lines between canadians and americans at that time especially east coasters that halifax boston connection was probably more related to each other than boston was to chicago you know like right this is this is a very tight there's a lot of back and forth so him moving to boston is not leaving canada you know, like it is, but it is. Absolutely. Uh, and so he's referred to throughout his career as as Canadian, uh, you know, or, or a lot of it was Bostonian. But but I mean, he never lost his Canadian connection and, and reference. Now, he didn't he wasn't you know, he wasn't waving the flag, but not many were waving the Canadian flag at that time anyway. <laughs> but but right. you know, it, it's it's he did move to the States and it's easy to claim him there. But 
No, absolutely. Like he 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 maintained his Canadianness in the eyes of a lot of people for for you know up and well, yeah, up yeah. really past. Yeah, it's a well worn corridor, like you said, because before him, you had uh, the original George Godfrey coming from Prince Edward Island, and then George Budge Byers. And Byers trained Langford. Langford came along the same route, and so did the mysterious Billy Smith. And all those great fighters went down there, you know, from the Maritimes to to Boston because that's where the fighting was. There wasn't fighting. They had some fighting in Halifax, and there was fighting in Toronto and Ottawa and Winnipeg, but it wasn't nearly. You could make a living in the states. You could make a living at it in Canada. Same as show business today in 2023. You can make a living in the United States, but you certainly can't in Canada. So that that was the land of opportunity, and not just for Dixon, but fighters from all over the world. Australia, as you know, England, they all wanted to get to the United States. That's where the big money was. Yeah, it wasn't just a black opportunity thing. It was an opportunity for all over. And that was, a, I mean, you know, as a time where we really, <laughs> you were you were really labeled by your your race or ethnicity and that was kind of part of your marketing a lot of times right you know that was part of the part of the sales pitch when they uh when they, when they... and that 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 went up to um 30s and 40s jimmy mclarnon and barty ross you know they yeah. called they called mclarnon the jew killer and mclarnon sued papers for that because yeah. he said these are my friends these are just the, the i don't care what their religion is they're my friends my hero's benny leonard i i i'm not discriminating against anyone but it sold tickets, it filled stadiums. And, you know, with George Dixon, I wanted to ask you, you know, wh what it must have been like for him when he's going to these places. I, I read a story, I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, where they asked him, you always fight in ring center, never see you fight on the ropes. And he pulled his pant leg up. And I read this in an article that, uh, or one of Nat Fleischer's books, which were notoriously uh, factually incorrect, but, <laughs> and fantasy, but where Dixon and Walcott and Gans had, you know, bumps, bruises, and big chunks of skin missing from their knees and legs because their opponents, cornermen or fans, would hit them with pipes and all sorts of things. You know, it was that bigoted. Well, and we, now, you know, we, we look at it with modern eyes that these audiences are coming into, a, you know, sitting in their seats and they're secure. You know, we're picturing it in a modern context, but Man, some of these right. fights were these things were free for alls, man. You know, you'd see you'd see stories in the paper the day before of things you can't bring. You know, <laughs> like please, right. please no pipes or, or canes or stuff like that. You know, right? It's uh, it was a far more rowdy experience. So yeah, like you'd see reference to it uh, in fights right. and stuff. But I, I mean, I never saw him directly speak about that having to fight the center ring because of that but you certainly see these kind of uh, mentions of it in, in fight stories that i totally buy it totally buy it you know <laughs> oh yeah I, I mean there's a story of uh, you know jack johnson had to fight with people in the audience that had uh, shotguns i mean just to think of the the cojones it took for dixon to go fight in the south in the tournament of champions and anywhere and beat a white guy and easily beat him, knowing that everyone there didn't like him and wanted to hurt him. It's and still, you know that that moment. And, and I dedicate the largest chunk of the book to that to that single fight and that and that three day championship, which is a pretty significant time period. But uh, in 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 all of boxing all, history, American history, and world history, everything coming together at once, right? And you got like yeah. this taking place. This is essentially, you know, the Civil War is fresh. What we talked mentioned earlier, like. It's as fresh to them as 9/11 is to us, right? Like, like that to, to people of a certain age, that that was just yesterday, <laughs> you know? right? Oh, yeah. uh, so the him going south, I mean, him going south of the Mason Dixon, which is something he just did for that. Like he kept he kept fights kept fights north, just probably for his own safety. But I mean, the the firestorm that created uh, in the press local governments it pretty much ended mixed race fighting <laughs> you know for a generation down there and this and it's because he just pummeled the hell out of us <laughs> i mean he, he he carried him i mean he could have easily taken him out in a round 
you know, skill set was so su superior. But one of the things I love you mentioned in the book is how he stood up and said, there's got to be black people able to watch the fight. Yeah, and there were... It's a it's an interesting story on that whole venue and how they put this thing together and you know the city didn't have fighting for a while and it was worried about the element and rightfully so they kind of gathered around that and they do this carnival thing they're bringing I mean there are stories in papers in California about this thing and there are advertisements of from from train tickets to like packages almost to go to this this was a big big deal and part of this part of his conditions that he set down was reserving a certain collection of tickets for uh, black members of the community there which you know that community is heavy influenced in that that black french creole was still very very influenced down there and uh, uh so oh, yeah. strong black population down there that that kind of got to participate in this kind of important event yeah, just so people watching know, that's where Louis Armstrong came from. Oh, so that's it, yeah, that's a very fertile area. And I mean, what Jason is it? I mean, that was not, wasn't that unlike him to do that to make a racial stand like that? Yeah, like this was not his thing. This is a tough, you know, this is a tough thing to bring up, right? Like we hmm. we love to portray, you know, we really would love him to be a black hero, and he really wasn't like i don't think he had the opportunity to a lot of times he was right. really hemmed in by his white manager he was married to his manager's sister uh you know so here he is married yeah. to a white woman who was you know if his manager wasn't controlling his wealth his wife certainly was so like he was completely trapped what happened to you know we've been trying i've been trying to trace her for years even tom's not the easiest you know, right? That's true. Yeah, like the O'Rourke's are not an easy, easy. I mean, it's such a, I mean, common name, of course, but like it's, it's a, it's a line that was tough to find. Like I wanted to confirm there were no children. Like I, I right. never seen reference to one ever, but it's, it's. I, I mean, that is a like she is a great untold story in that. Like, I would love to have some pieces. There were some interviews with her. Like I found there were a couple of them. But nothing much more than that. Yeah, I, you know, we we both know Tony G, the bare knuckle historian in Britain, and he he sent me some. I'll send you probably have it um, stuff from overseas, from Australia about George Dixon in Britain, and it mentions her. But just just in passing, Dixon come over, but didn't bring his yeah. wife Kitty with him, and because and that's it. You're thinking that's yeah. all you got? Yeah. <laughs> Can't you say anything else? <laughs> It's frustrating because you tried. It's, it's almost like at a place from Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid. It's almost like she's been erased from history. When years ago, I was lucky to speak to Andrew Dundee, introduced me to Ray Arcel, the great trainer. And I, there's a bunch of people talking to Ray. And Ray said, someone, and it's the only time they said they ever saw Ray get angry. And someone said, Is it true that Fanny Leonard, who he trained, and Joe Gans and George Dixon, all these guys had thick fights, and the boy did our cell get angry. And he said, they weren't fixed in the common sense you understand the word. They were fixed in the sense that no one, people were literally terrified to get in the ring against George Dixon. And unless he agreed not to absolutely annihilate them in a round or two, they wouldn't do it. They would say the money just isn't worth the beating. So he would have to agree, I guess, to carry them for eight rounds, let them hit him. And then after eight or nine rounds, they would say, okay, go ahead, yeah. you can fight now. I mean, that's incredible. Yeah, and you see- To have handcuffs. And you just see the number of fights that are like, we don't know. Like you're, he's attributed up to 900, I've seen 12. Like, like just, but this was these, you know, he, he'd become part of these shows that would come in and all, you know, all, he takes on people from the audience. You know, like it was just some of the stuff was just chaos. That was just he was just exposed to outside of his normal, normal agreed upon fights. It was wild. Well, this is the one thing I want to ask you. I think I can understand the eight nine hundred fights and even up to twelve hundred. And I have, and you have more than I have, obviously. Um, 
but you've seen this photos of him saying George Dixon fights five men tonight. Um, and there's several of those. So if you, if you, and math is not my strong point. <laughs> That's why we became writers. If you, a... <laughs> it, it, yes, absolutely. And, you know, I'm like that SNL sketch of Chevy Chase playing Daryl Ford. I thought there would be no math. <laughs> that was the agreement. But when you look at him, five fights a night fighting people from the audience and, 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 and also, you know, fighting under different names because he didn't want to give a work the money. So he might fight two or three times in a night in the same area, but different clubs. You could understand how the, he fought that many times. It's just almost impossible to trace oh, them all, though, unfortunately. Yeah, it's, it's impossible. Like, we're dependent on, you know, and it's something, you know, it's something interesting. I think you probably had some great insight into as well. It's, it's, you know, I think it's important that we get some of these stories down from this era because we're increasingly dependent on our source material being digitized and that is so expensive to do mm -hmm. and it's the first thing cut by you know first of all these newspaper organizations are swallowing up each other and the archives are not being well preserved uh, you, you, libraries are strapped for budget so digitizing these old going back and digitizing these old papers is not a priority um and so i you know it, it's getting harder and harder to access some of this information that that helps tell these stories of of these fighters and uh so it's it's you know even for this book i think about half you know, probably about more than that probably about two-thirds was digital archives uh and the other third was was some physical physical archive work and and help from people that you know it's, I was lucky that the um, Police Gazette, National Police Gazette, had, still has their collection of stuff, even though it's not online. Some folks down in New Orleans were really helpful um, in archives down there being able to pull some stuff off and just throw on a copier for me. Um, but yeah, the, these uh, you talk about these stories, these these people disappearing. It's it's the actual source material is getting harder and harder. I mean, do you find that as you're doing your research? Like, what are you finding? Yeah. I absolutely with some of them i want to do one on george uh buyers and yeah it's just very yeah. diff it's difficult when, when i spoke to yeah it, it, it you speak to various people and it's just yeah the, it's very hard to find it or if you do find family members it's i want some money for it yeah right but I, and you say yeah. i'm writing this history of your relative i'm not going to make much if any money on it i just want to make sure they're remembered forever <laughs> i don't have thousands to, to ask ask you if he had four siblings or three siblings i mean really so but yeah you're right and it's heartbreaking to me jason because it's destroying part of the fabric of a country when you when you don't do that and what you said about the papers was so bang on because we see every day in, in in canada but in the states and around the world this paper lays off 200 people this paper lays off 50 people they're laying off their archive section they're laying off their sports section and you just think, what are you doing? You're 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 laying off history that we need that that people have to know about. Yeah, that's, that's why people yeah. grow up and don't know about George Dixon. To me, it's criminal that that he's not a household name in Canada. It's absolutely criminal. I totally agree. And I think that's why this Parks Canada uh, recognition here in the last few weeks is is huge. Because of you. you know, it's it's the first. It's, it's hard to believe, but it's the first national recognition of, of George uh, in Canada. It's, it's a plaque, it's, but it's, it, it's a physical plaque in Halifax. So yeah, it, and, I mean, it's still a plaque, but it's, it's being part of this, being named that he's now going to have some digital footprint and the government, digital, mm -hmm. digital footprint among Parks Canada. And I've already noticed that I have, you know, news alerts for George Dixon, CBN pops that and you like you notice now if you search George that pops up now so it's the the prominence is is bubbled up a little now it'd be nice that's because of you though because you cared enough to do yeah. the book and you brought him this is what almost brings me to tears it will if I don't control <laughs> myself you brought him back to life you put flesh on the bone you reach back through the sands of time you grabbed his hand and you pulled him into 2023 so when people read this this i mean this it's not only a brilliant book it, it it's part of world history and 
you know, if you have if you have any sense of morality as a person, if you if if you're a person that has empathy, and, and it's so much more than just a sports book or a boxing book. This is an important human being who affected millions of people throughout the world. And Jason, you brought him back to life. You put us beside him every day. You know, so the saddest thing to me that did bring me to tears is when the book ended because <laughs> my attitude was I wasn't ready to leave George Dixon yet. I still wanted to be there with him, you know, and this has to be done into a movie. This has to be done into a documentary and into a full length movie. It has to be because he deserves it. I, I first of all, thank you. Uh, those are very kind words. And it's, it's it and was true. the mission I went into it with is to, to resurrect and bring him back a little bit. My thing is, I tell people, listen, man, I just told a story of George Dixon. It, this is far from the story. There are eight, 10, 20 other books you could pull out of this and just run with. You know, you could do a whole a whole series on when he goes to Great Britain to fight because there's opportunity for and he and the other black boxers go there because there's opportunity and less racism in Great Britain at the time. They're doing circuits and making right. some real money over there. They, they flee the United States after after Plessy versus Ferguson, you you can I mean, the Carnival of Champions to me could be <laughs> could be an eight part Netflix series. You know, <laughs> like there there is so much going be. on in that three day period. It's wild. It's wild. I, I always tell uh, people the story, but when I did Cinderella Man, I said to Ron Howard, "You have to understand that this is just one of so many evocative stories about the sport of boxing." I said, there's George Dixon, there's Sam Langford. There's so many great stories about the human condition that will upraise people today, will just lift people up and make their hearts soar. And and I mean, who more than George Dixon? I mean, the man invented the speed bag. You know, he invented shadow boxing, won the world title, lost it, regained it. And, and oh, a wall, a tsunami of racism he had to walk through each time. And he just his skill level was just unbelievable. Oh, oh, and yeah, well, you know what? And died from young. When Cinderella Man did well, that maybe boxing. I love the older boxing movie, but they're they're cinematic in that they take this great sport for for the screen, contained, you know, violent, you know, a lot of action, you know, but. What Cinderella Man does, it put it in, it took this sport and it took it out of the ring too and put it in a great larger context of the world. Like what was going on outside the ring and how was it manifesting itself inside the ring? And I, I think there's, that's where the opportunity on Dixon is, I think, is that you can tell, you can just tell an inside the ring story him and it's fantastic. But if you can set up a larger societal context, which is easily done, um, I, I think he has a lot more, a lot more to say. But there's, I agree. I, I got a lot of flack from people in boxing because they said Max Fair was a nice guy. And I said, I know Max Fair was a nice guy, but I was an actor who was told to keep my mouth shut <laughs> uh, by, by my agent. And that's exactly what I did. I wasn't there as an archivist or historian. I knew Max Fair didn't kill Ernie Schaff because, he, you know, Schaff fought like four or five more times. So you can't have traumatic brain injury and yeah. keep fighting. Um, with, with Dixon, with his money, did did his money disappear? I mean, was it a combination of Tom or taking too much is combined with him like wanting to be a sport? You know, as Randy Roberts would say, wanting to buy booze for everyone and different ladies and stuff like that. He just spent and it too much a, too quickly. There's enough evidence of that. A lot of them would get a lot of these fighters, not just black, but just these you know, these guys were mostly poor, a lot of immigrants, you know, so they were taken advantage of. And when they got money, they didn't know better and they spent money. And so there, but a lot of that, you know, there's also some stories about George that you're like, eh, that sounds like you're, you're just using that to make a racial point. But this one is, this one about him being a spendthrift and gambler, like, yeah. Like there's enough evidence in the black papers of them. There's, you know, George is so well known that he was, like he was the subject of sermons, you know, <laughs> on Sunday morning in, in, in the black churches, you know, that uh, not wow. only on the look at what our look at what our, our race has accomplished, but also in the here's the moral pitfalls of this lifestyle kind of stuff. So, you know, yeah, so a lot of it was just burnt. And those guys 
uneducated. They were drawn into that lifestyle anyway. And, and it just, it just kind of flew by fast, but I, you know, but I, I still contend George, most of his money went to Tom. <laughs> it's, I, I I don't doubt. The same thing happened with Joe Gans and Al Herford, and when when Gans, Gans left Herford, Herford uh, uh, blacklisted him. And in I don't know if it's in my in my book or on my Substack where I said Herford belongs on the dung heap of corrupt managers at the very <laughs> top because what these guys did to their fighters. I mean, you want to you want to kill. There there was a fighter here in Toronto in the late 40s and 50s named Little Arthur yeah. King, African-Canadian yeah. fighter. He was a lightweight and he was ranked one, never lower than two by Ring Magazine. The champion was Ike Williams. And so he fought as much as he could here and in Britain, became the Commonwealth champion. And his manager was a guy named Davey Yak, whose younger brother, Baby Yak, was a fighter. And Baby Yak was famous for going to the Olympics, the alternate Olympics in Spain uh, with Sammy Lovespring and then had to turn back when Frankel took power. So Davey Yak takes his fighter, little Arthur King, down to New York. And he gets into the hotel and there's a knock on the door and it's Blinky Palermo, puts a gun to his head and says, get out. And Davey Yak, I mean, he's he was former fighter, but he was tough guy himself, doesn't flinch. He goes to get his suitcase and Palermo says, no suitcase, just get out. And so they took over Arthur King. They put him on the shelf. They wouldn't let him fight um, Ike Williams. And then seven, he made no money. And then seven, eight years later, the the promoter Frank Tunney in Toronto paid Carbo $500,000 to free him from his contract to bring him back home. And so when I met Arthur King in the 80s, I asked him, you know, with Palermo, and he just went, no, 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 no. Well, Carbo, no, no, no. He said, I don't talk about it. I, I, I can't. I cannot talk about those people because I will go down there, get a gun and oh. kill them. They stole, you know, 15, 20 years of my life that I can't get back. Oh. If you, anyone mentions it, I will go commit murder. I can't do it. And, and you know, he's, it's the 80s. He can say it, you know, I mean, without repercussion. But back in Dixon's time, he can't come out and say, well, you know, the guy that, right? You can't say O'Rourke's a crook and he's doing this to me and that to me because he'll be banned by O'Rourke. Oh, yeah. And then, you know, he broke up with O'Rourke briefly uh, when he mm -hmm. was starting to lose his, lose his value and he bumbled around. Like, he needed O'Rourke just as much as O'Rourke needed, needed Dixon. He needed O'Rourke. And you know, I think he knew that. And, you know, Dixon still lived very comfortably. You know, there are some mentions of him being among the richest black men in North America at one time. Like, it's just hard to hard to picture what that what that is. But I mean, and who fed that information? And you know, <laughs> like I'm not sure he had access right. to all that money. And you know, but you know, he 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 lived pretty well until Tom was done with him, and then you know he's he's in poor folks homes and he's in asylums and he's you know bumming around and fighting for 50 bucks kind of stuff. like it's wild yeah it's once he's once he's cut loose he has no no ability to self-support or continue on his own and you mentioned how he kept downsizing in his houses he kept going he had a nice house and a smaller house and then a smaller house and his wife i wonder what the Breaking, I guess, I guess there were a lot of breaking points with Kitty O'Rourke. Yeah, what a story. Like, if there's one piece I would love, there's nothing in the ring that I really would want to follow anymore. But if I if I could open up a magic box and pull out a stack of information, it'd be on her. Like, like right. that's that's the one piece that there's nothing there that I would love to love to reveal. Really, I know that there was a member of of and we're both members of the International Boxing Research Organization, older guy. And when he died, his daughter said that he's got, he had ton, more information than anyone on earth for a hundred grand, it can be yours. <laughs> but I, I don't have a hundred grand and, and I got kids like you do. And I can't, <laughs> I'm not gonna tell my kids, I just spent this money on a box of, you know, newspaper clips, but I would love, like you said, to see what happened to Kitty O'Rourke. 
I, I don't know where, where where we would trace where you would trace it where you, you would go. I'm trying to think what a hundred grand would buy me. I'm not sure what's out there because you know there's not a lot. If you look around the various halls of fame, even collectors. I've talked to a lot of collectors, like these real hardcore guys that go drop a hundred grand on some gloves or something like that. There's not a lot of Dixon memorabilia out there. Um, no. I've got a ticket from the Carnival of Champions that I found from a collector. Uh, wow. There's a couple little things like that. Never found any equipment. Never found anything with this signature. There's a, there's a couple things that went up for auction that were proven to be fake. Um, there's not a lot of things on him. You know, there's some... Even the, if you go back, it's later in his career, but when the tobacco cards, like the sport right. cards and stuff, you can find some about 1898 to about 1906. Um, there's a handful of cards of him. Um, but I've never seen anybody say, oh, yeah, I've got his championship belt. You know? Right. I opened the book, like, it, it's described in the 20s as someone of ha having it in a window. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, um, I, but I've never, I mean, maybe there's some mystery collector out there that just keeps everything private. But I've never stumbled on any, any like pieces of him, which is really interesting too. I've always thought, Jason, there should be a company that recovers things like that. I, I once helped. Like an Indiana Abe. Jones of sports stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Abe Patel had a title belt and. I was mentioning it to a friend in Australia. I said his family in San Francisco still wants it. They want it back. This is five years ago, 10 years ago. And they said, there's a guy here in Australia. He said, I'll check it out. It He has it. But he's, I said, I don't know if he'd sell it, but if he did, it'd be for a lot of money. But the family was talking with the guy who had it. And the guy who had it had it legally. I mean, he purchased yeah. it off someone. So, yeah. um, but it'd be wonderful to find all those artifacts from Dixon trunks gloves if, if they exist and even that fountain so maybe you, know, you maybe you know better than i do oh yeah fountain like even you i was talking to new york about it like i talked like they were going in the they did a yeoman's work for me and they're like i'm not 100 percent sure that's where it was i'm like well here's it is in the paper <laughs> they said this is the internet right. they're like well when was that there's some art draw there's some drawings some architectural drawings of it there's some artistic drawings of it there's pictures of it. There was one picture that shows both sides. <laughs> Even folks in New York, like, oh, I don't know. There's a tunnel there now, you know. <laughs> so, but maybe, I mean, maybe you know this, but I've always wondered in boxing. You know, you go to the Boxing Hall of Fame; it's a nice venue, but it's not Cooperstown. You know, they right. don't they don't have a collection of. You know, I go to Cooperstown; they're pulling out stuff that. Honus Wagner was uh, wore on his head one game in 18, 1898. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, why? Why do you like? Have you encountered that? Did it all go to collectors? What happened to boxing history? Or did it just get thrown out? Um, that's a good question. I, I know the Hall of Fame. I'm a, I, which I'm on the selection committee there for the old timers yeah. specifically, but they most of their stuff isn't shown. They don't have room to show most of it. Mm -hmm. So when a guy like Hank Kaplan, who was the head historian, the boxing historian, um, when he died, his his um, archives were valued at seven million, and he gave it to Brooklyn College because yeah. he said, "I don't want it." To, he said, "I love the Hall of Fame, but I don't want it to sit in the basement." And so he had posters going back to the 1700s. Really? Oh, and, wow. okay. And gloves worn in the early 1800s, and trunks, and and just odd articles, uh, yeah. you know, early speed bags, early heavy bags worn by this person. And, you know, he had the, it was supposedly the first ever mouth guard, which was worn by Ted Kid Lewis. <laughs> so he said, um, and it ends up, I guess, in the hands of private collectors. I know when Angela Dundee died, I went to the funeral and I went back to have lunch later at a guy's house with a bunch of people. He was a hitting coach for the Yankees. And I'm telling you, Jason, I I was I could not I still can't believe the the um, sports memorabilia he had not just posters signed posters of Dempsey and Willard 
and Ali and Frazier. But he, he had Ty Cobb sign baseballs, Ty Cobb um, uh, bats, Babe Ruth bats, uh, you know, shoeless Joe Jackson glove, a bat and a hat. He, he had the most, but he'd been in the sport for 60 years. But he had, it's a lot of private collectors have this stuff. So some of them, like uh, Craig Hamilton, called me once because I was looking for something for George Dixon, and he had George Dixon's um, day timer. But I didn't, you know, I didn't have $32,000. <laughs> no? <laughs> and I, had no doubt. I had no doubt it's worth that much. I just didn't have the money at the time to, to spend on it. So I asked a friend of mine, a promoter, how do you get those things? And he said, you go to estate sales. Okay. You know, yeah. he said estate sales, a lot of people don't know what they have or they just want to get rid of it. Yeah. And they'll sell anonymous boxes or they'll sell something. This is some sports guards from the 20s. We'll sell it for a grand, whoever wants it. And then you look inside and you can't believe, you know, what you have. So, um, um, yeah, it's just, it's incredible. So, uh, yeah, like you said, Cooperstown is heaven on earth. And, Box the Boxing Hall of Fame has some too, uh, but they just need more space yeah. to put more stuff out there. And and like you said, Dixon's somebody that we want. You know, it's like you're sitting at a table and there's only enough pieces of pie, but it's the best pie ever for like two or three people. You're looking at Dixon and you think it's got to be more. You know, <laughs> there's, there's got to be something out there somewhere. Someone has his belt. And Has gloves to. and other other memorabilia, but they're just not telling people about it, or the, maybe they just don't know. Maybe it's in a basement, like when you found his book. Most people don't know he had a book out. Yeah, that could be. And did he write that book himself? Do you think, or was that ghost written? I didn't see any evidence that he didn't. Like it, okay. it, it certainly seemed like like his. Um, it's not a less than thing. Yeah, it's not a detailed, it's not a novel. You know, it's not, you know, it's not three, four hundred pages. It's, it's a it's a pamphlet. And you see a lot of those from that era. Um because there was a real interest in there was a real side gig in these guys when they came to town. They would teach private lessons to some of the some of the wealthier folks in town and come down and get a get a lesson in self-defense or in, in, in boxing or whatever they were happened to be interested in so and this was this was the merch of the time you know <laughs> you pick up the book yeah. you pick up the, book the gift shop and you get the <laughs> you get the book on the way out the door um there aren't many of them out there i've never seen another copy outside of the one at the archives that uh i think that was tulane i hope i'm getting the right it, um but uh um uh, no tulane had the uh, i'll have to find out where that i can't remember where that archive was but there's only one i've seen Tulane had the one, the program for the Carnival of Champions. That's who um, had that. But yeah, I mean, there are some things you read some, uh, there were these um, sashes they would sell at the fights and these kind of ribbons that they would sell at the fights, the, their fighters' colors and the fighters' colors for different things. So there was a lot of merch at the time. I mean, people were making money off this just as they do today. Um, so I got to think there's a shoebox in somebody's closet somewhere that's got a few of these things sitting around. So. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I know specifically with Dixon. I mean, he's the one everyone, you know, the fighter without the flaws, they said in the police gazette. Mm -hmm. And you would think there'd be, uh, well, let me ask you this. Have you met or are there any of his relatives? I mean, I met one of his relatives. What am I saying? I'm His great, great, great grand nephew was a school teacher with my um, sister. So uh, I would speak to him occasionally, but he, he, I think he spoke to him too. Yeah. Right. And there's so George too. Yeah. And the problem is we're so far removed from George now. No one, he's, he's as much a, a myth to them as, as he is to somebody outside the family, but the Dixon family, is right. the original families of that area, you know, there's a lot of Dixon still to that day to this day uh, that are that are out there so i mean there's 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 a line his brothers were very popular and famous athletes in their own right you know uh, hockey players and and yeah uh, i mean so uh, not an unknown not an unknown name and not an unknown family there so um 
but yeah, you're kind of getting down the line to a point where, and this is another part of preserving the legacy, man. Like, you know, you're you're doing stories on guys in the '40s, and we're losing those people that remember those people. You know, like it's right. we're we're not only losing these the originals, we're losing the people that have memories of the originals, and it's I think that's why we're why it's so important that we're going out and capturing as much as we can right now. Yeah, some some of the fighters, one fighter, I don't know how to pronounce his last name correctly. It was from Britain, Full Jamie's or Full James. Yeah. And he came from Britain and with his brother, settled in Winnipeg and fought in the States. He was murdered in his last fight. Um, he went to shake hands and the guy hit him in the head while holding his hand and then kept punching him. And it, it was a setup and everyone disappeared and no one claimed credit and, and, uh, uh, the coroner lied, but every, it turned out everyone had been paid off. But it took me it, it took me a long, long time to find where he was buried. And finally, he was shipped back to Winnipeg and buried there. But still, most people wouldn't know him. And, you know, apparently, they, I read that he fought for the world middleweight title against the original Jack Dempsey in Toronto, although I could find no record of that fight here, only the same date in, in Kilgill or... or in in new york upper new york state but no one knows about him and you know he was a britisher but got canadian citizenship and disappeared and the guy that killed him said was killed by his friends a couple weeks later and then i find a record for him boxing five or ten years after that oh. so we, who knows yeah there's no way of saying for sure 100 percent. and that's frustrating if it's someone like you or me because you want a definitive answer you know, we want to know what Dixon and you know, one thing I found interesting about him was he was really loved by John L. Sullivan, who drew the color line. Sullivan was a bigot, but maybe it was because Dixon was considered high yellow or 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 for whatever reason or not a threat. But but Sullivan helped him out. Didn't Dixon name him as a friend? Oh, yeah. And, you know, Sullivan had this great jolts from John L. column right. that ran coast to coast for years it's, to me. Yeah. it's madness it's just great like it's it's just it's just it's not only on fights he's settling scores with other fighters but he's riffing on politics and it just it's just and it's classic it's classic john l like just boastfulness and just raw crazy it's just the best thing to read still to this day but more than once he goes and talks about how great Dixon was as a fighter, how great of a man he was, how screwed over he was by Tom O'Rourke and the raw deal he got from people. And, you know, like really went to the mat and this guy's, a, he wouldn't fight somebody for the championship because it's black. He wouldn't go fight in places that led blacks fight. And here he is defending Dixon. I, I think a lot of that was, uh, there is a lot of Boston camaraderie that comes out mm -hmm. of that. There was a, a, a folks from that area did have a little bit of a i mean maybe you see it in boston still this day a little bit of us against the world <laughs> kind of mentality um so there was some commonality commonality there and you know uh, it's it's really interesting to see someone like that so publicly too like it wasn't he was asking but so public on his own just going out and defending dixon like that. probably more boisterously than than wonder work or any of the people in supposedly dixon's corner ever did yeah, that's un unbelievable. He de he also defended George LeBlanc, the fighting Marine who was Canadian, and kept him on his old timers tours, even though LeBlanc was way past his prime and usually quite drunk, mm -hmm. and still paid him. So John L, I guess he he's a hard guy to label. He's contradiction in terms because he was supposed to fight the Canadian George Godfrey once at Madison Square Garden, once on a barge apparently. And, and apparently on the barge, he called the police himself, so the fight never <laughs> came off. And when Godfrey challenged him in Madison Square Garden, he just, he waved it off. And I still think Sullivan would have beaten him. They were both the same size, but Sullivan was so much stronger, you know. But he was basically, he wasn't as skilled as Corbett or the other ones. He was just, you know, it was like, just a yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, like Richard Pryor said about Foreman, George Foreman, before each fight says, tell me which one's the referee because I'm going to kill the other guy. <laughs> you know? 
So he just would storm in and throw punches. No, I'm not going to say no skill, but no head movement, no trying to faint a guy into position, just walk in and, and bang. And, you know, maybe it's no coincidence that his his dominance starts to decline and end when some structure and some rules start coming in. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know that's, uh, that carnival yeah. champion is, is one of the first titles that's fought you know, under a stricter guidelines. And Mark so, the career, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, he was a brawler. Like, yeah. Sullivan was the guy you wanted behind you, or more likely in front of you at a bar fight. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, he, he welcomed the Marcus to Queensbury, but for one reason, because of the gloves. He was tired of breaking his hands and his knuckles. But you're right. He had no, there was no problem with him grabbing you by the hair, kicking you That's in the right. leg and throwing you down. No. Because that's the way you fought back then. <laughs> and then pounding on right. the campus. Right. And, you know, they have a rare photo of him and Jake Kilrain, but they, in the last couple of years, they found another 20, 25 photos from that fight. And they're just fascinating to watch where, where Kilrain's on the, on the grass with his hands up and Sullivan's got three guys holding him back. It's like, let the guy at least get up, you know. <laughs> It just yeah, just a complete brawler. But like you're saying, you know, the times change. He he ducked Peter Jackson, who was probably the best heavyweight in the world at the time. Yeah. Who it was six one, who I think would have destroyed him. And in fact, most people don't know when he went to Australia, he wouldn't fight anyone there. But Joe Kowinski was there at the same time and Peter Jackson offered to fight him for nothing and Sullivan said no. Yeah, he's, he's there's I mean you want to talk another fascinating character? I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I could go for days on just Sullivan. Like, this is my problem. I tend to go down these side paths and then need to get back down. <laughs> Those are the interesting things in sport and, and in life. And Sullivan, I think his, you know, racism comes out of fear, which comes out of ignorance. I think he was just afraid of Peter Jackson and black fighters. Oh, absolutely. Think, yeah. Oh, absolutely. That was the. I mean, that was a lot of the drive behind everything then. Like, mm -hmm. it was, it was a, oh my God, we've had these people enslaved for 20, for 200 years. And now, not only are they free, but they're getting gains and, and starting to become almost equal. We have to do something to stop this. And right. when you're talking about it, on one side, you're talking about Jim Crow laws that start popping up. Or in sports, you start talking about just a lot of refusal to fight, just a lot of refusal to let them play. A lot of, you yeah. know, so a lot of guys suffered. I mean, yeah. Jack Blackburn, who trained Joe Lewis, couldn't get a title fight. And Jack Johnson drew the color line, you know, after he won the title. He wouldn't fight Langford again, although he destroyed Langford when they first fought. But Langford was just a kid. But he wouldn't fight Joe Jeanette or, or Harry Wills or other guys, Sam McVay. And he, I mean, McVeigh, I think was a good fighter, but he was, he was more of a brawler. But Johnson himself drew the cutter line because he knew how good the fighters were. Yeah, you know? it's, that attitude is, you know, it continue. It, it defines the first half of the 20th century. Like it now, really does. Yeah, and uh, I know a lot of what Matt Fleischer wrote about George Jackson was just made up. I mean, because the stuff he said about... I got a lot of trouble with some people for saying that, Lou. So. <laughs> I got some very angry notes. <laughs> because Fleischer, speaking to Clay Moyle about this, Fleischer was saying how um, Dixon, for Dixon to be that smart, you know, he had a white father, which is not true. Yeah. Um, they, they Definitely his ancestors were brought up here from the Mississippi area during the War of 1812 on a British ship, which you mentioned but his parents were both identified in the census as as black and yeah. there's no evidence of white blood but yeah. fleischer perpetuated this myth that his mother had had an affair with a with a sailor from the british army which simply didn't happen <laughs> of which there's zero evidence zero. Yeah. <laughs> it just made everything up <laughs> and 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 and, it, and because there was nothing else out on him, on Dixon, it it's, people sort of accepted it, but it was simply not true. You'll see people today asking about that, and you think, no, it's not true. It's a complete lie. 
written by a bigot. But but see that was but that was and that was the problem with no one. There's I mean when nothing's written about you for a hundred years, um, you just kind of go back to that original source and say, oh, that must have been it. You know, yeah. so that. Those books are what the early twenties, the yeah. like Dynamite series. Yeah, that was like 31, 29, yeah. So you know, that was you'd see articles in the 50s and 60s that would mention Dixon in their list of greatest finders, and it would just be parroting stuff that was out of, almost straight out of that book. Yeah. You know, that was their main source. I have a book called Ten and Out. There's two books called Ten and Out. One of them was written by my late great friend Ron Ross, who wrote a book on Emil Griffith. This one was written in the 20s by Alexander Johnson, and he's writing about fighters he'd seen, such as Dixon. And it's interesting. I got it for $3 at a second-hand store <laughs> in Ottawa, and and like 30 years ago. And he's writing about how brilliant Dixon was. And he, he, he you know, what you read today, and you think, well, you know, the middleweight division or lightweight or this division goes back to 1890. But he gives you a, he's going right back to the early 1800s with British and American fighters saying this fighter beat this guy and then this guy came along and then this guy beat him and then he fought dixon but dixon as you said in your book had to fight you know he keep ha kept having to fight this is what i want to ask you he to win the bantamweight and featherweight title uh he had to beat two three people is that because there was no centralized authority in boxing or is that just because he was black and they made him Kept saying, not good enough. Got to beat this guy. Now. I think a little from column A, a little from column B. You know, there's no, I mean, as much as you can say there is anymore, an overarching organization that was dictating it. There was also no real through line. So it was, you know, well, okay, you beat the British champ. You got to beat the British champ now. You know, that, I think a lot of it was just not wanting to hand the title to Dixon right away. I think. Right. I, mean, I think O'Rourke rubbed people the wrong way and didn't want him to have a champion too. So they kept setting these different, oh, well, wait, well, now you got to go fight the Australian champion before we're going to consider you, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, and it's just a, like we were talking about earlier, it's just not, it's a chaotic system. Like it's not an organized system. You're fighting under different rules fight to fight sometimes. So um, for them to even be able to identify a champ is, is, Pretty extraordinary to me in the first place. I think. Yeah, and and when you're reading about some of the articles from back then, it obviously like anything you you, you read, it's colored by the person's mm -hmm. opinion who's writing it. But you're reading these articles about you know Dixon beat this guy and Dixon beat that guy and then this guy has to beat and this was a closer fight and he got a gift here and he got so you don't it's hard to ferret out what is true and. You know, it, it, because these are just writers. They weren't necessarily boxing writers. And then you get... Yeah. You get um, One of the know. nice things about that era, to me, is the vibrancy of the media in these cities. So Boston would have 25 newspapers, and half of them would go cover the fights, the championship fights. So you get a lot of voices. You know, the vibrancy of the Black newspapers across the country, which... Part, not, not all of them exist anymore, but some real preservation efforts to digitize those and to make those widely mm. different set of voices. The National Police Gazette, I could talk about for days. It's a fantastic resource. It's occasionally the National Enquirer, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but another amazing resource in covering at least these landmark fights throughout the career. So you could, you know, you talk about the Carnival of Champions. You talk about Dixon Skelly. I've got 50 people. I've got 50 articles of people covered. That's really cool to me uh, is that you have that many. They say a lot of the same things, you know, <laughs> a lot of times. But um, the follow up pieces would sometimes be different or a column would come out and be different. But th that vibrancy was really cool to kind of be able to get. Um, also, some of the localizers, so Boston would cover the fight. Due to the distance and the time, they might not get that in the paper right away, but um, the, the blow block below, at least. But they cover these people. You know, no TV, no radio, no. Right. They would go down to the telegraph station or the newspaper 
and they'd be hanging results outside and there'd be 3000 people watching a watching a fight standing outside you know <laughs> Yeah, or if it was Jeffries and, and Johnson, there'd be like 30 or 40. Yeah. People. People, yeah. people don't understand because boxing is a niche sport today. The back then, it was boxing, baseball, and horse racing. Mm -hmm. That was it. And you look at, I, 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 I'm glad you said that because the National Police is that I'll tell you how many times, I thousands of times I've looked up fights from the 1880s or 90s or early 1900s, and you're reading about it there. And I thought, I didn't know that. Yes, I didn't know this person refereed, or I, I, they never even mentioned he fought this guy. How come no one mentioned it? And then you look it up, and you go, he did fight that guy, and you, you just can't believe that you know other people have 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 missed those things. But they they have so much information packed, and then when you're scanning it looking for one fight, it, you know, online, and you're thinking, wait a minute, I was looking for this a couple of years ago. I can't believe this guy's listed. Wow, this is great. I mean, it's Incredible. such a treasure trove and a snapshot of time, of the world at that time. And, you know, you get sidetracked on a headless body found in topless bar kind of story. You know, like, yeah. like it also covered these madcap National Enquirer-like stories. So it's a, that's it's very a funny. really interesting, valuable publication that's sitting out there just full access. And, you know, it's still... I, I called them up and they made copies of hundreds of things that aren't digitized for me uh, on covering does, this. The National Police, does it still exist, the National Police Gazette? Uh, <laughs> no. Yes and no. I, it has a, there's a digital footprint still. Um, okay. That I know. But I thought when you said you called them up like you were calling their headquarters. No, just the people head who kind of run their archives and stuff like that. But oh, okay. uh, I think his name is William Maids. I think his name is Willie Maids. Uh, but, wow. um, yeah, but it's a, you know, they covered, you know, they, they, uh, their stuff wasn't tinged with race, which is interesting. Some of the police yeah. coverage was some of the violent stories certainly were, but when it came to sports and especially boxing and particularly Dixon, they covered him like the champion he was. Some of the best coverage comes out of, yeah. comes out of that. The Fighter Without a Flaw, that was from the Police Gazette. Yeah. And you and the amazing thing to me is you look at a guy like Stanley Ketchell, who was not racist. He that that he he hung out with Sam Langford and used to go to whorehouses with Jack Johnson, and that they went to his funeral and they were crying. Like they really loved him. And he was good to them. I mean, he was a decent guy. And and it's but it's sad that Ketchell like that or someone else stands out. Terry McGovern the same way stands out because they weren't bigoted. Yeah. You know, yeah. McGovern and Gann were very good friends. They hung out. And it was just, it wasn't, you know, it was never personal. As with, uh, unlike Battling Nelson, who was an out and out unrepentant bigot, but, but, um, who Gann still helped. But, you know, but yeah, I like, uh, I mean, you mentioned his, you know, I mean, the funeral, like Dixon died penniless. And, yeah, uh, in an asylum, and you know, just you see some of that last photo of him. He looks nine hundred years old, but you know, his death and funeral was a cause for like this, it was a municipal mourning. Like it was thousands of people outside the church, and and just mm -hmm. it was a it was a major event, and they looked to commemorate. And you know, he's buried there in Boston, but. Um, they looked to commemorate him in some way, and that's where you, we were talked about the fountain that was in New York City um, that was in his honor. And, and they were trying to erect some, <laughs> you read some of these stories about these monuments they wanted to erect for him that looked like the Washington Memorial, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, that never came to be. But, um, you know, it was a real, it was a real moment. These guys, it was a rather meaningful moment for them. When he passed away, he wasn't completely forgotten at the end there. No, and your coverage of the funeral and, and his death and the funeral were just magnificent. I mean, it's sort of uh, juxtaposition to say magnificent when you're talking about someone's death, but it, it's still it's very very moving, and it really gives it gives the reader a real glance at how important this person was, and, and because of that, how important he still is you know, to people today. And 
when he died, did he, he died of tuberculosis? Yeah. <laughs> Officially, I think he was, he was, you know, riddled with alcohol. Yeah. Probably had yeah. no liver left. You know? <laughs> yeah. You know, my, it's interesting. My, my kid brother is a doctor and he always says to me, yeah, you have to understand how primitive medicine was. And, you know, you can only do what you can do at the time. And for tuberculosis, there's really nothing you could do back then. You know, it, stuff that we could easily treat today. And they and being I, an alcoholic. Yeah, oh. yeah, they could identify it pretty easily. It's like, ah, that's good. You know, it's. Uh, yeah, because they're, they're just looking for one particular need thing. Yeah, the thing. Yeah, to say he had tuberculosis rather than. Same with uh, um, uh, Joe Gans. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and. And then uh, uh, Barbados Joe Walcott just disappeared, got hit by a car and marked in an unmarked grave and buried in an unmarked grave. And, and people didn't know who he was. He was just walking on the street and got hit. I mean, there's there's the real track. Like Dixon died in a terrible way, but at least he was remembered, right? And they knew who he was. That's, there, that's not a solo story either of these guys dying, not only penniless, but mm -hmm. anonymously which is even worse. These, these once heroes of people that just whatever happened to, they don't know, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. I, one, th the, one of the last things I want to talk to you about is, um, uh, the Kentucky Rosebud because yeah. Nat Fleisch, Nat Fleischer makes a big thing about how he dominated and knocked out Dixon twice and Dixon didn't win around. And I've, I've heard so many varying stories that, Dixon took a dive. Dixon was knocked out. Um, Tom O'Rourke denied it. And I mean, what what was the true story of what happened? I don't know if we know. I don't know. You start seeing oh. you start seeing a lot of people. You know, this is this is this is on the decline. So mm -hmm. there there are a number of stories at that time where Dixon's needing uh, the legacy to be propped up to keep him valuable. Uh, so Dixon's certainly not going to admit, I mean, uh, O'Rourke's certainly not going to admit that he was knocked down. Um, right. you know, th there's a, I mean, this is a modern excuse. There's just, there's a slippage story, you know, <laughs> but, um, right. and it's important. yeah, they, well, I was going to say, it's important to remember that he fought, I think that week he'd had, that was his third fight in a week or a week and a half. Yeah. You know, I, so that's a lot, but it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, Rosebud's an interesting character. You see him pop up a little bit, um, but I don't. I don't know a ton about his continuation. Do you know a lot about him? Like, have you followed much of him? Not, not really. I've, I've tried to research. I couldn't find much. There, there was the saddest story I ever read, boxing or otherwise. I, I have the book Black Genesis, mm -hmm. and it covers the, the guy who wrote it. Wrote. I, I covered uh, black boxing, I guess, from. 1690 till 1940 or 1950 and and in the year i'll i'll remember the guy's name later but there was a fighter in the early i guess late 1890s early 1900s a black fighter was on a train going over a bridge and the white conductor just said give me a ticket you, know, you have to buy a ticket he said oh i did buy a ticket so i gave it to you it's, it's that one i have a mark and he said give me buy a ticket you have to buy a ticket i did buy a ticket I, and his father walked over and said, don't argue. And he said, I, I'm not going to argue. I'm just not paying for another ticket. And the conductor shot him and threw him off the train. Oh. And father just went back to the seat and sat there. Nothing he could do. Because he knew he'd be next. So the, the, in the book, the guy just said this was emblematic of how so many blacks were treated back then. But, you know, this was a fighter who was well known in the area. And the conductor just didn't care. You know, so th their treatment... Fame, you know, you know fame meant nothing. Carried you so far, you know. Yeah, I mean, the, my favorite jazz artist, Charlie Parker, the saxophonist. People use the N word in bars at times to refer to them. They didn't care. And after a while, how much can you take before you go out and lash out at someone? You can only take so much, you know. And and I guess there's you fight back physically, like Jackie Robinson eventually did, but he held it in and it killed him. Or like Dixon, you hold it in and it takes emotionally, it just rips your insides out. There's not much you can do. So you figure, why not drink or do this? Because no one else cares. Yeah. And you know, but, 
but with Dixon, it was different. People did care about him, right? His family cared, his wife cared, everyone cared. They begged him to to um, to uh, straighten up or whatever. But I guess he was too far gone. Yeah, and it's you know didn't know better. Like again, like just not not overly educated, not you know a life. Right. Let's no life skill. Let's look at the physiology. I mean, eight hundred to twelve hundred times get hit in the head. Like like this was not a this was these were there were no ring doctors at that time that were taking care of me. No, <laughs> you know they were not stopped. Were these not. fights would go on and on occasionally. Like you know he's fighting 80, 90 rounds in some of these championships. Like it's it's the physical toll. It's hard to even hold anything against him about making logical decisions later in life. You know? Yeah. And, and even now I, I posted an article on Jeanette Zakaria Zapata, the girl from Mexico who was killed in Montreal two years ago. You probably remember. And um, the neurosurgeon from Montreal spoke out and said, um, I've interviewed, done personal examinations. I interviewed hundreds of athletes. And of the hundreds of athletes, he said a lot of them are boxers, MMA guys, uh, football players. And I got the report from their neurologist saying that their severe concussion is cleared and they can participate again. But when I examined them, of all the ones I examined, uh, out of 100, let's say, he said a good 45 of them weren't able to go back and play. The examination was wrong. They weren't using the right tools. And he said the data that boxing uses today is outdated by 50 60 years oh. and he said people just don't understand that it takes one punch to end a guy's career and it it you know so back then like you're saying dixon 800 fights getting hit so many times and the best example is ali getting hit 30 times 40 in his prime and then you go when he comes back and the legs are gone and he's getting hit two three hundred times a fight hundred and something times in the head times 40 fights, your brain can't take that. No, no, not at all. You're not, you're not, it's just not meant to. So we don't know, you know, the actual effects on Dixon, but it's certainly, it certainly affected the way he thought about things when you combine that, I guess, with his alcoholism and tuberculosis and whatever else he had and depression. There's so many factors could play into it. You know, there was a lot of, you know, there's a lot of obsession about the physical nature of Dixon. And uh, certainly the medical science was not at a point where it was looking at his brain by any chance and the damage he was taking. But there was, I mean, he was a physical specimen for a guy who was very tiny, you know, five, three. Yeah. You know, um, you know, here's a well, look at you on the cover of your book, the muscles, the musculature yeah. of the guy. I mean, it's incredible. There are articles obsessing about yeah and you see this a lot pre by almost tail of the tape kind of articles but dixon was a particular interest in you know talking about his body and and in high detail and the, the, what goes into creating it and it gets <laughs> it edges it edges a little creepily into you know some of the descriptions that you read of slave auctions and then yeah. and obsessing about the black body in that sense but um it, but he was regarded and was, you can see in the photo, like he was a physical specimen. He was small, uh, a small frame, a small stature, but he was not, he was not a slight man. So there, there's, um, he was built to take, to take the beating, but uh, I mean, just nobody can take that kind of thing. And then later in life, make no. decisions, you know? <laughs> yeah. Angel Dunn used to say it's not the size of the fight and the fight but rather the size of the fight and the man and no one had more fight than him what what, what do you think finally is his legacy george Dixon's lasting legacy well i hope it's not written yet you know i i hope that we've reopened another discussion like i said i, I tell people i said i've not written the story on george i've written a story and i want i hope this and people read it and go boy i'd like the reason I wrote about Dixon, I read his name and said, oh, I'd love to find out more. And I went to find out more and there was no more. So I hope people find a little nugget in this. They say, oh, I'd love to find out more about that. And they go to find it and see it's not there and go write their own book. Um, so I hope his legacy is finally being reopened. Um, and I think this, 
honoring by Parks Canada is going to really help. I think that's going to give us a, a, a little bit of a stepping off place. I think we're going to annoy, you and I are going to annoy Canada Post to the point where we're going to get them a little bit of a recognition someday in that sense. I'd love to see him brought to the screen in some in some quantity. There's something about him or with him as a member. Yeah, absolutely. Like I think we're just starting out. I think I think we're having. You're right. And I think the time is right. I think I think Canadians are discovering their own unique identity outside of the U.S. history. I think they're starting to embrace some Canadian history. I think our sporting mm -hmm. history is now becoming of particular interest, which is exciting with our. And I, you know, with our prominence and, you know, the Olympics has helps with our, with our role. And I mean, we're becoming a world power in basketball slowly, you know, I mean, and, you know, just I, the interest in sport is going up beyond the box scores and seeing us in a larger global context. And I think we'll start reexamining some of these places from our past. I'd love to see George Shavalo get a similar treatment. I like to see some yeah. of these names from the past really get elevated and get the credit that they deserve. Um, I'd like to so sit down with them. Oh, you did? Have you talked to Have you talked to George ever? Or? No, no. I'm saying I'd like to take you and sit down with Canada Post. Oh. and say, listen, Jason's going to talk to you, and don't interrupt him. <laughs> this is his book. I'm going to get you a copy of his book, and you guys are going to read it. And you can't read it and tell me he doesn't deserve a stamp. And I'm just, I'm just going to keep talking, which I will do. Yeah. About him until we're. <laughs> I'll just wear you. You're, you're part. You're part of his family now. You're the guy that represents him now. That when people, you know, you're the one that says he counts. He matters. And that's one of the things I love about many things I love about you, but the fact that when you first said there wasn't much information, and as a, a, a great writer and historian, you just said no, not good enough for me. Not I refuse enough. to take that answer. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Not good yeah, enough. That deserves more, and I think we're just, I think we're just starting out on another edition of it. So. Well, I, I'd love for, I mean, I, I, I'd love to see a Canadian Boxing Hall of Fame and a George Dixon wing, and then we could have you, you know, come in and, I mean, this should be something that's taught in schools from an er, the early grades up, and that people could study in university, right? And you could come in and talk to them and answer their questions and help all these students across Canada do more and more and more research. Because as you said, you know, there's there's still stuff out there we don't know and, and we oh. deserve to know. And he deserves to have us know. And new ways of looking at it. I mean, I'm a 50 year old white guy. So uh, I'd love to have some, right. I'd love to have what, what younger voices would love to see. I'd love to see what black researchers could find. I'd love to see, you know, I love people to take it from different angles. And like his story is so rich and so, and so full of importance in and out of the ring that, that I, there's, there's plenty there. Let, let's have some academics take a hack at it a, a little bit and put it in other contexts. Yeah. So. It's a story that will always be relevant. It just happens to be now in our world more, much more relevant today. Very much so. You know, yeah, in, in years past. And, and I, I urge uh, all the people here watching that, you know, go out and buy. The, they can get the book on Amazon. Absolutely. Yeah. And get this book. You have to get this book because you'll be happy you did. And when you get this book and read it, you'll point to the books in your boxing library, but this is the one that you won't lend out to anyone or let anyone borrow. <laughs> get them to buy it too. But you gotta, I'm telling you, George Jackson, one of the top several, not only prize fighters ever to have lived, but in his time was more popular than Tiger Woods. And one of the greatest athletes going back three, 400 years and deserves to be remembered. In Canada, starting with Parks Canada, that's a great start. But as Jason was saying, there's got to be a stamp on him. There's got to be a feature film. There's got to it's documentaries. There's so much more that can be done, you know, and and has to be done. Jason brought him back to life, brought George Dixon to life, and we have to keep him alive. We absolutely have to keep him alive. I want to thank Jason so much for being on the show. It's been a pleasure and a privilege to have oh, you on. This is a real honor, Luke. So 
it's uh, I'm what I'm really excited. You can make time to talk to me because I think you're also writing your next book while you're there. I don't know how you have time to do all this writing, but I'm just. Uh, <laughs> I, I love boxing, <laughs> and it keeps me away from my wife. It's, so, anyways, but don't tell her I said that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so thank you so much, and I I look forward to having you again uh, on the show soon. Thank you so much. It was, it was a real pleasure. Oh, thank you. The pleasure is all mine. Well, my name's Lou Eisen. This is Ring Talk, and we'll see you again next week.